The year is 1993. Vodacom Group has just been incorporated in South Africa. Following its rapid growth, the group decided to expand its territory. Within a few years, it has risen to become one of the leading African communications group. Currently, its mobile network covers a total population of over 300 million people across South Africa, Tanzania, Lesotho, Mozambique, and Democratic Republic of Congo. In 2009, the group reported an annual revenue of $4 billion, with the Congo subsidiary accounting for $200 million of that total. Vodacom's rapid expansion and growth in Congo was made possible by this Gambian man, Ali Badara Mohamed Conte, the founder of Congo's first GSM company, Congolese Wireless Network. In 2001, his company was facing financial difficulties, so he decided to sell 51% of it to Vodacom for a fee of $75 million and then renamed the company from Congolese Wireless Network to Vodacom Congo while retaining 49%. It all started in 1952 with the birth of Aliu Conte in Gunjur, a small coastal town in southern Gambia. Aliu was born in a poverty-stricken family where neither of his parents went to school. When he was just six years old, the breadwinner of the family, his father, died leaving behind five children, four boys and one girl, all of whom were raised by a single mother. Their mother was a woman with a very strong will. She worked in the farms and did petty trading just to fund the education of her children. And unlike her husband, she lived long enough to see her son's early successes. Aliu had always been an ambitious and determined young man. He got his strength and will from his mother. When I think about how my mother managed to raise five children all on her own, just the thought of that keeps me going. It's 1982 and 29-year-old Aliu Conte has just moved to Congo in search of a greener pasture. When he arrived in Congo, he began as a small trader. And as time passed, he grew the business and began trading metal and foodstuff. As the business grew, so did his outlook on life. Congo was rich in minerals and while most Congolese were looking for work in mines and factories, Conte found a way to build one at a time when most people were skeptical about doing business in Congo. Because if you set up a business in Congo and started to grow, rebels will come out of nowhere and take away everything. But despite the instability and the insecurity in Congo, Conte used the money he made from his business to build two coffee processing plants, one in the Eastern Congo and one in Kinshasa. He would buy coffee beans from locals, process it and export to London. He did this a couple of times and realized that low-key, he just discovered a gold mine. Well, a gold coffee mine. There was a demand in London, and in Congo, he gets high-quality Robusta and Arabica coffee for cheap. He stuck to the simple process of buying cheap, processing, and selling high. He repeated this process over and over again, and his wealth grew immensely. But guess who were pocket-washing? The rebels. In 1997, during the Civil War, Rebels attacked both his processing plants and he lost everything. But luckily for him, even though he lost his factory and assets, he had some money saved up. <laughs> All of this occurred during Mobutu's presidency. He built a business and lost everything within that period. When Father Kabila took over in 1997, he made a speech that inspired Conte to go back to business. Not the old business that he was doing, but a business that he knows absolutely nothing about. Kabila's speech went something like this. There will be zero tolerance for banditry and corruption. We will restore peace in this country and we will make sure there is law and order, good education, roads, and telecommunications. When Conte heard telecommunications, immediately something clicked like he saw an opportunity and didn't hesitate to grab it. Congo is the third biggest country in Africa, and at that time, the population was almost 50 million people. Imagine a population of 50 million, and there were only about 15,000 fixed lines and 10,000 analogs for communication, most of which were built by a US company. Like only senior government officials, Kabila's bodyguards, and wealthy businessmen had access to them. Meanwhile, the average Congolese had to stand in a long queue at the post office just to make a call. You can see that at the time, telecommunication was a luxury in Congo. Conte wanted to change that and make millions of dollars in the process. But the thing was, he didn't know where to start. Like I mentioned, he doesn't know 
anything about telecom. He reached out to one of his friends, who is a friend to Congo's Minister of Post and Telecommunications, Kinkela Vinkasi. The friend introduced him to the minister. When Conte met with the minister, straight up he told him that he wants to get a telecommunications license. Again, this is a guy that knows absolutely nothing about telecommunications. So the minister said to him, Mr. Conte, do you know that to build a GSM company requires a lot of money? Conte, being the persistent guy he is, replied, if your government gives me the license, I will build the network. Again, the importance of connections and knowing the right people comes up. Following his meeting with the minister, he contacted one of his friends in the United States who has a friend in France that works for Nortel. When Conte made contact with that Nortel staff and told him about his plan to build a GSM network and the market in Congo, the guy showed interest immediately. In fact, three days later, he flew to Congo to conduct a feasibility study with Conte. Once the study was made, Conte told him to go back to France, take his time, and develop a captivating proposal. The guy did just that, and three weeks later, he had developed a proposal and presented it to the government on behalf of Conte. The government went through the proposal, and they were pretty impressed. Four months later, the minister invited Conte to his office and told him that his license have been approved. But before they can issue it, he must pay $100,000 to the central bank, which he did and was eagerly waiting for the GSM license. In that three weeks waiting period, the minister called. Conte was excited because he thought, finally, my license is here. Out of nowhere, the minister said, uh, Mr. Conte, you have to pay another $100,000 before we can issue the license. Conte took a deep breath. He knew how bad he wanted this and won't let a single thing stop him, even if it means using all his savings. He went ahead and paid another $100,000, still without the license. The ministry kept him waiting until January 1998. Minister Kinkela went to a Pan-African conference in Uganda. When he came back, he called Conte and said, uh, Mr. Conte, the Ugandan government sold their GSM license for $8 million. And Uganda is a small country, so our license is $8 million. Conte lost his school. The next day, he went to see the minister. When he got to the office, he said, Honorable Minister, $8 million for Congo? In the future, maybe, but today, absolutely not. Everything is broken. There's a civil war. Everyone's leaving the country. No one would pay $8 million for a GSM license in Congo. Finally, the minister asked, Well, Conte, how much can you pay? What do you think the license is really worth? Conte said, $2 million. Later that evening, around 10 p.m., the minister called and told him that he got the license to operate a GSM network in Congo. But he will only be given a year to build the network across the country. That was a huge challenge because number one, he couldn't raise funds. And number two, the civil war was still at its peak. Rebel troops had closed Kinshasa airport. Foreign manufacturers were unable to send in a cell phone reception tower. Conte had to convince local residents to collect scrap metal and make one themselves. We built this tower during uh, the war in uh, Congo. Uh, at that time, the fighting was close to Kinshasa here. This tower here was built by the locals. They collect the pieces together. And when this tower was done, we were protected by the population. Funding was his main problem and the clock was ticking. Remember, the government gave him a year to build the network. And with the situation in Congo, it's almost impossible to get investors. Conte needed more time. He went back to the minister and discussed the matter. They gave him more time. You know, sometimes you just have to trust God's timing. Exactly around that period, Nortel introduced a new system called PicoNort. An easy to set up and a cost effective GSM network solutions that cost about $2 million to set up. Since investors were running away from Congo, and even Congolese nationals were not investing in Congo, Conte had to figure out a way to quickly attract investors. He held a meeting with his lawyer and they came up with an idea to set up a dummy corporation in the United States. And they called the corporation African Wireless. They made the paperwork and assigned 60% of the Congolese wireless network shares to African Wireless. On paper, everything looked legit. But in reality, <laughs> it's a different story. But at the end of the day, it worked. Conte got what he wanted and his strategy attracted investors. And after securing some investments, he flew to France, met with the Nortel executives and acquired the Piconod. Conte flew back to Congo with some French engineers to set up the network. Once the setup was done, 
The Congolese Wireless Network was launched in 1999. The first two years though, the company struggled. Conte couldn't pay his staff full amount because of the financial situation of the company. And his best bet at that point was to sell half of the company for $75 million to the South African communications group Vodacom. After two years we struggling and have the personnel sacrificed on salaries because I couldn't pay them. But one thing what I told them, this company don't belong to me, it belongs to all of us. I might not be able to pay you today, take 25% salary. 75, we wait till whenever we can make it. So doing so, we build the network together. After years and years, the war started in Congo. All over the place, Vodacom and many other networks contact me and join uh, a partnership deal in Congo. From 30,000, when we joined with Vodacom, estimate my company with 30,000 subscribers was about $75 million. I took about 10 million to pay other local expensive personnel, the rest to inject in the company as my capital and change the infrastructure name to Vodacom Congo I returned 49% and Vodacom have 51%. The relationship between Conte and Vodacom was going well until in 2009 when Conte accused Vodacom of fraud and abuse of trust and sued Vodacom for $14 billion. Since then, the relationship deteriorated. MTN and other companies wanted to buy the shares but Vodacom rejected all offers made. And up to date, Vodacom still owns 59% and Conte 49%. The value of his shares in the company are estimated to be worth around $2 billion. There you have it. This is the story of Aliou Badara Mohamed Conte. A big thank you and shout outs to Ombre and Papi for contributing to this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you are inspired. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel, to like the video and share it. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. And the most important thing that you can do right now is to subscribe to this channel, like this video, and share it. Peace.